Francis and Mike. Hope you enjoyed. Bye. Good evening and welcome to Scotland at 7. My name is Ben Francis and tonight we're, we'll be joined by regular guest, former MSP for the Scottish National Party, Maureen Watt. Hi Maureen, how are you doing? Hi Ben, <laughs> nice to see you. Whew. That was a bit of a rush. <laughs> yeah, a bit of a light start, but I'm sure we'll manage. So on to the Ukraine update. A lar large explosions and fires have been reported in Russian-occupied Crimea at the near, near the Dakowe airbase of the Russian Navy. Videos online showed fires and flashes in, in succession that might indicate stored ammunition catching fire and exploding. White House officials have said they are taking a wait-and-see approach until the House Speaker Mike Johnson releases details of his plan to pass aid for Ukraine. Speaker Johnson is considering a more complicated approach that would break apart the already Senate-approved 95 billion aid package and send it to separate votes, then either stitch it back together or send it send the components to the Senate for final passage and potentially on to the White House for the presidential signature. Johnson is preparing a fourth measure that would include various Republican-preferred national security priorities such as a plan to seize some Russian assets in US banks to help fund Ukraine, and another to turn the economic aid for Ukraine into loans. The New York Post has meanwhile published Republican-aligned polling that shows a majority of Republican voters in electorates, in electorates crucial to the November election back US assistance for Ukraine's fight back against the Russian invasion. Russian forces are exploiting the delays to US aid to switch from fighting for individual positions and instead maneuver on the battlefield again. The Institute for the Study of War has warned, quote, Ukraine cannot hold the pressure cannot cannot hold the present lines now without the rapid the rapid reassumption of US assistance, particularly air defense and artillery, that only the US can provide rapidly and at that scale. Czech Prime Minister Peter Fayale said 20 countries has pledged enough to buy 500,000 artillery shells for Ukraine outside Europe within the so-called Czech initiative. Fayale said there was no reason why the donors could not deliver, quote, 1 million more in the next 12 months. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has signed a mobilization bill into law with the aim of boosting troop numbers on the front. On PBS NewsHour, President Zelensky said a lack of air defense missiles prevented Ukraine from thwarting a Russian missile attack last week that destroyed the Trubliska thermal power plant. German weapons manufacturer Rheinmetall is to build an ammunition plant in Lithuania, Germany's largest military equipment maker, and the Lithuanian government signed a letter of intent to set up a factory to make 155mm artillery shells in the EU and NATO member country. Ukraine said it had identified almost 37,000 people, including military personnel, who are unaccounted for since, their, since Russia launched its invasion in February 2022. Xi Jinping had agreed to back a Ukraine peace conference in Switzerland, Germany's chancellor said after meeting the Chinese president. President Zelensky welcomed the development. Well, sorry, President Zelensky welcomed the, the, the development. Beijing has called for a quote political settlement to the war, which Western countries warn would enable Russia to hold much of the territory it has already seized from Ukraine. China has deepened its ties with Russia and, according to a U.S. assessment, is surging the supply of machine tools, microelectronics, and other technology that Russia is, in turn, using to produce missiles, tanks, aircraft, and other weaponry for its use in Ukraine. So, Maureen, just to pick up on the point about China's call for a political settlement, what do you make of that approach? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, um, that China is doing that. Um, I hope that China will to persuade uh, Russia to come to, to um, the table, um, but without our problems um, f with Ukraine and its allies, particularly the US. I mean, clearly Biden is having a huge problem with getting the Republicans in the House to 
come on board, um, and particularly through the Speaker, uh, who's a Republican, getting the Republicans to come on board. And it just kind of reminded me, Ben, when you were um, giving that update about how the US were late to the Second World War as well, and how many lives could have been saved if um, the US had come in earlier. You know, either you are a united front in the West or you're not. And the fact that there's talk about, um, I think you said, aid becoming a loan rather than a gift shows the kind of problems um, that we're in with uh, the US. So, um, but on the ground, um, you know, that Ukraine is still battling away. Um, they've had some success in the Crimea. So, um, yeah, it just carries on, doesn't it, relentlessly. Do you think that um, the aid package will pass in America? Uh, do, you, like, do, do you think the Republicans are against giving aid, like, totally? Or do you think it's more of they want the amendments, like we're just talking about? Well, I could be very cynical and say, since we know that Trump is pulling all the strings with the Republicans, he's almost, well, he is acting as if he's already won, isn't he? And he's pulling all the strings with the Republicans in um, the House and in the Senate. And, you know, is he thinking, well, I'll just keep this going, regardless of the loss of life and the huge cost and then I'll come in and do a deal with Putin. Is that what he's thinking? I wouldn't put it past him. To him, it's all about Trump. Maybe I'm being completely wrong, but the fact I'm even thinking about it, I'm sure others are thinking about it too. Um, so will it pass or will it just go to the wire uh, before the election? I don't know, but there's a lot can happen between now um, and November, isn't there? So um, I really feel sorry for Zelensky. He was questioning the West's uh, commitment today, I think. And um, it's little wonder that he's kind of losing patience um, with the West and particularly um, with uh, the United States because um, they are the biggest ally. They are the biggest contributor. And um, even with the EU doing the best that it can, the, the problem is still the US lack of commitment at the moment. I don't think it's Biden's at all, um, but I do think that the Republicans are just playing games with people's lives. Hopefully the, um, the US electorate will, will see that. Okay, yeah, well, I guess we'll find out in the next couple of months what does happen with that bill. But in the meantime, on to our next story, our Israel Gaza update. At least 33,899 Palestinians have been killed and 76,575 wounded in the Gaza Strip since the 7th of October, according to a statement by the Gaza Health Ministry. The statement said that there has been 46 Palestinians killed and 110 injured over the last 24 hours. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu thanked the visiting foreign minister of Germany and the UK for their support today, but said Israel would reach its own decision on its security. German foreign minister Andalia Burbach said she made clear to Netanyahu that the Middle East must be allowed to must not be allowed, sorry, to slide into a situation whose outcome is completely unpredictable. UK Foreign Minister David Cameron has also called for the for restraint saying while it was clear for the well while it was clear the israelis were preparing to act the uk quote hopes they do so in a way that does as little to escalate this as possible netanyahu's office issued a statement which also said he had told cameron and burbach that israel that israel rejected claims by international organizations that there was starvation in gaza in march the interrogated the integrated, sorry, food security phase classification, IPC, stated that 1.1 million people in the Gaza Strip were experiencing catastrophic food insecurity. In Tehran this morning, Iranian President Ebram 
Raisi warned that the quote tiniest invade tiniest invasion by Israel on Iranian soil would bring a quote massive and harsh response. The 25 crew members of the MSC Ares, which was seized by Iran on the 13th of April, are, si- are safe. Shipping from MSC said today, adding that discussions with Iranian authorities are in progress to secure their earliest release. Negotiations between Israel and Hamas to secure a truce in Gaza and a release of hostages have stalled, Qatar's Prime Minister said today. Palestinian news agency Wafa reports that Israel has, quote, intensified airstrikes on Gaza Thay and the central Gaza Strip, killing dozens and injuring others with various wounds amid widespread property destruction. Israel's government has accelerated the construction of settlements across East Jerusalem, with more than 20 projects totaling thousands of housing units have been approved or advanced since the start of the war in Gaza six months ago, planning documents show. At least 18 people were injured earlier, one critically, when what appears to be a Hezbollah-fired rocket or drone hit a community centre in the northern Israeli border village of Arab al Armishi. Italian Foreign Minister Antonio Tagini today called on Israel to halt its military operations in Gaza. The call comes ahead of Tajini hosting a G7 foreign ministers meeting, which is expected to press for further sanctions on Iran. The US is also expected to impose new sanctions, with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan saying they will target Tehran's missile and drone program, Revolutionary Guards and Defense Ministry. Al Jazeera confirmed that the Philippine Lazarani, um, Commissioner General of the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNRWA, will brief the Security Council at a meeting requested by Jordan. According to the report, the session is due to begin at 7pm GMT, 8pm British Standard Time today. So, Maureen, just on the sanctions, do you think that's the right response from the West to attempt to use sanctions to politically pressure Iran, especially, I guess, given the history of the West's attempt to use sanctions, like in North Korea or Cuba, you know, to try and pressure countries to do, you know, to act in political what they want and the lack of success of those previous attempts? Yes, I think... um... You're right in your assessment, Ben. Um, I said on previous programs that sanctions um, are fraught with difficulty. It maybe sounds good to the domestic population at home for those countries that are talking about imposing sanctions. But um, there are so many ways to get round them by um, Britain and other countries selling the goods to um third countries, if you like, and then them making their way um, into Iran or, um, you know, the the sanctions in Russia, for example, don't seem to be working at all. The the economy in Russia hasn't been affected and it's because goods go to, as I say, another country who will be allies of Iran, of of Russia, and then um, are sent on. So the same as ha- will probably happen um, with Iran. But on the wider um, Middle East conflict at the moment, um, you know, what's worrying me most is the increase, um, the, the increased aggression of the West Bank settlers against um, the Palestinians um, there. Um, and that combined with continued bombing Um, and destruction of Gaza. I mean, I don't know if you saw on um, mainstream media last night, the the, the row of mile upon mile of of people walking um, along the main road next to the shore on in Gaza, moving from south now from Rafa, where they thought they were safe, back up um, to Gaza City. It was just unbelievably horrible to watch um so n- there is nowhere safe in, in gaza and clearly netanyahu hasn't finished his work there um so it, it's really heartbreaking 
Yeah, no, that's definitely true. I've I've seen a lot of a lot of image from Gather, and especially seeing the uh, especially seeing the before and after shots, especially seeing the before and after shots of the cities before the invasion, after, and just how it was destroyed is mm-hmm. quite heavy, quite a heavy thing. Yeah. So to the next story, which is financial, financial. The IMF says cutting national insurance may have made reducing UK debt more difficult. The International Monetary Fund has issued a strong warning to the UK and other countries facing elections this year to avoid voter giveaways that might their public that might pose risks to their public finances. In its half yearly fiscal monitor, the IMF said the reduction in national insurance contributions announced by Jeremy Hunt in his budget last month may have already made cutting the UK's national debt more difficult. There is speculation Hunt might announce further tax cuts ahead of the autumn election, but the fiscal monitor makes it clear this would be against all the advice of IMF officials. The Washington-based IMF's analysis showed the national debt as a share of the economy's annual output, the debt-to-GDP ratio, rising steadily in every year between now and the end of 2020s, from 92.9% in 2024 to 98% in 2029. The IMF said the decision to spend $10 billion on a 2% reduction in NICs was a, quote, significant cut, and well in part funded by, quote, well-conceived tax increases could worsen the debt trajectory in the medium term. Commenting on the IMF World Economic Outlook report, the FNP's economy spokesperson, Drew Hendry, MP, said, quote, as a result of this failing Westminster government's disastrous Brexit and mismanagement of the economy, Scottish households won't see an improvement in their living standards for the second year in a row. Quote, the Tories have created a broken Britain which is causing economic hardship for ordinary households who are now bearing the brunt of their reckless decisions. Westminster is failing Scotland and with the UK showing the weakest growth of all G7 countries except Germany, more and more people will realise how badly Westminster politics have served us, or, or sorry, have held us back. Quote, Scotland can and will do better with the full powers of independence. Only a vote for the SNP can guarantee a strong team of SNP MPs standing up for Scotland's values and upholding the Westminster status quo that is failing the Scottish people. So, Maureen, I'm just wondering, what do you think of the tax cut in the first place to national insurance? Do you think it was a mistake from the Conservatives? Yes, I do. In the current economic climate, it was. Um, It's as if they are completely ignoring the disaster um, that was Brexit and then the further disaster that was the Liz Truss um, government. I think it's a cynical ploy um, in the run up to an election. Um, It clearly benefits um, business. Um, And, you know, it, if we get more tax cuts, as Jeremy Hunt seems to be indicating, um, it is, um, while it may be welcomed by some, I think people, the electors and the voters will see it as a cynical ploy and it's not going to save their skin, but it is going to further weaken um, the economy. And this report um, today does show that... Um, that it may it, it it will make reducing the the debt um more more difficult so it's piling up um problems for um an incoming government um i wonder who's going to write the note there's no money any left um which happened um i think at the last time uh, labor left office and the, and the tories came in i think that was uh what happened then so yeah um it's bad news for the long term although um you know that there may be some shoots uh, of recovery we'll see okay yeah well we'll see yeah so on to our next story uk inflation falls to 3.2 percent the uk's annual inflation rate fell by less than expected last month to 3.2 percent 
complicating the timing of a potential First Bank of England interest rate cut. Figures from the Office of National Statistics, ONS, showed inflation continued to ease in March from 3.4% in February to reach the lowest rate since September 2021, as food prices rose at a slower pace than a year earlier. However, that was a smaller decline than the 3.1% that the city economists and the bank had forecasted for in, in the Consumer Prices Index. Markets are increasingly betting that persistently high inflation could force the Bank of England to hold off from cutting interest rates until later this year. The bank has raised interest rates to 5.25% as it tries to bring CPI inflation back down to its target of 2%. Speaking in Washington today, Megan Greene, an independent economist on the bank's Nine Strong Rate Setting Committee, said that recent tensions in the Middle East could pose a risk to achieving the 3% target. So, Maureen, do you think as inflation falls, even perhaps potentially not as fast as they expect to fall, but still as it falls, there's a risk of those politicians who resided over the initial massive increase in inflation using this decline to effectively whitewash their responsibility for residing over such high inflation in the first place and they use the fact it's dropping as, like Richie Sunak seems to be indicating he might do, to um, use the reason of why you should vote for them in the next election. Yeah, well, he gave five pledges, didn't he, when he came into office? I can't remember all five, but one of them was to get the inflation rate back uh, to 2%. The other was to stop the boats. Another one was to stop the boats. I can't remember the others. But um, in terms of the inflation rate, um, yes, clearly it is falling from the huge um, to, uh, you know, 10 plus percent um that it was but it's not falling as fast as the bank of england would like in order to uh, decrease uh, interest rates um they said they would look at it i think in june and maybe this is giving them an excuse for not reducing the interest rates um in june and clearly people are still suffering especially those um who have mortgages and um, big loans and things um, so the the uh, inflation rate isn't falling as fast. One of the reasons, of course, is um, the ha a higher oil price um, than expected and food decreasing at a slower rate um, than was predicted. Um, I really, really hope that the Bank of England doesn't contemplate uh, increasing interest rates again I think that would be disastrous um, and in my view it may be if they wait to June that they should really at that point think about decreasing the interest rate and see what effect that has on the economy um, but there's no agreement ever <laughs> among economists as to what um, if the right course of action is so um, I think it's a case of wait and see. Um, but again, as we said with um, other things, you know, I think the electorate are wise to what the Tories are, are up to, not looking at the long term benefit of the economy and therefore the benefit of the electorate, but just short termism to, to keep them in power. Yeah. I, I think it's very short termist, especially with Rishi Sunak's goal of two percent inflation. The first thing I thought when he when he made that goal was that inflation is massively high under your government anyway. So getting the inflation down again to where it was previously is hardly much an achievement. It's just fixing a problem that your government resided over in the first place. But we'll have to move on to the next section, which is the Scottish Trade Union Congress backs calls to fully devolve powers over employment law to the Scottish Parliament. At the Scottish Trade Union Congress, STUC conference in Dundee, the STUC has backed calls to fully devolve powers over employment law to the Scottish Parliament. At present, the Scottish Government lacks the powers necessary to implement significant change to workers' rights, 
but has been consistently vocal in their desire to increase statutory sick pay, introduce a real living wage and better protections for trade unions and the right to strike. A transfer of powers has been consistently blocked and opposed by the Tories and the Labour Party. Commenting, the SNP's social justice spokesperson, David Linden MP, said, quote, with the full powers of our, of our employment law, we could, we could deliver where Westminster has failed. A real living wage, an increase in statutory sick pay, protection for our unions and the right to strike, and more could all be reality if we had these powers. It beggars belief that in the face of a crackdown on workers' rights by the right-wing Tory government, Labour could continue to support keeping these in power, keeping these powers, sorry, in the hands of Westminster. Meanwhile, the SNP has welcomed an intervention in the Scottish independence debate by Scotland's most senior trade unionists in an interview with the Daily Record at their conference in Dundee. ST, STUC General Secretary Ross Foyer said, quote, I think it's an unresolved issue and the STUC very much believes it is an important, sorry, it is important there is a democratic route that the people can use if they wish to express the wish to have another independence referendum. On pro-UK parties refusing to discuss the path to independence, Foyer is reported as saying, quote, that can be very da- that can be a very dangerous place to end up in when you're not allowing people to exercise their wishes in a democratic manner. The SNP have challenged Anand Sarwar to say whether he agrees that it is quote dangerous for pro UK parties to block all routes to Scottish independence. So, Maureen, I'm wondering what you make of this and how likely do you think it is that these laws could be, you know, moved into the hands of the Scottish Parliament? Well, I think it's crucial. And I think the only way that um, Westminster will take note of Scotland and Scotland's wishes is a strong SNP presence post-election at Westminster. So, um, you know, it looks like um, England is going to vote for the Labour Party um, this time. Um, just for a change. And we must remember that the Tories have been in power uh, many more times since the founding of the Labour Party, um, the 1920s, than than uh, the Tories. Uh, well, the Tories have been in many more times than Labour. I can't remember the exact figures. I remember quoting it um, not all that long ago. Um, but in terms of um, the... Uh, S2UC's conference resolution today, that is really significant. Um, Yes, we need a real living wage. Far too many of our citizens are still living in poverty. And that is um, really a subsidy to um, business um, and shouldn't be looked at um, in that way. Um, Zero hours contracts needs to be looked at um, and workers' rights. I have been very involved in helping somebody with uh, an employment tribunal case recently. And it's virtually impossible to do that without um, legal representation. And you need funds to finance that legal representation. So literally, people have no recourse against um, termination of employment that's um, unfair Um, or discrimination um, if they have no recourse to funds. Um, So that, to me, needs to be looked at as well. So, yes, um, we definitely need um, employment law devolved because there is no indication that the Labour Party are going to divert or diverse from um, the the blue Tories. Um, They're just going to continue... Um, as the red Tories, so um, the um, the only way that we can get um, employment rights as they have on the continent. My daughter has recently joined um, the um, as a rep on the um, employee council in her work, um, and the training and the uh, influence that they have in the company is immense. And you know, I used to work for a German company, and works councils have been 
the norm there for decades and decades. And I remember joining the party, the SNP, 50 years ago and talking about um, a manifesto with works councils back then. So there is a huge way to catch up um, with employment rights in other countries. And all of that, I think, is really important for economic growth as well, because a happy workforce is a more productive workforce. Um, but at the moment, everybody just thinks their nose is to the grindstone and there's no incentive to, um, you know, be more productive or, or, or um, the wherewithal in terms of investment by companies to be more productive. So this is absolutely essential in my view that it's um, devolved. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. Thanks for that. So on to the next story, Democrat, Democrats sorry, take control of Michigan in lower chamber in lower chamber after special election victory. Special elections for two vacancies in the Michigan House of Representatives change control back to Democrats, who organizers say could use their restored trifecta in the state to pass legislation protecting voting rights and election administration. A push to codify voters' protections stalled after two Democratic lawmakers resigned and the party lost its majority in the House of Representatives last November. Mai Zong and Peter Hasberg, Harrisburg sorry, were elected on Tuesday to represent sections of Detroit and its suburbs. In November 2022, Michigan voters passed a constitutional amendment enacting sweeping election reforms, including establishing early voting, expanding absentee voting, and preempting the creation of stringent voter ID laws. The following year, the Democratic-controlled state legislature passed legislation to enact to enact the amendment, setting aside more than 40 million in the state budget to fund the measure to expand early and absentee voting, which was adopted by election clerks across the state. In their last legis legislative session, Michigan lawmakers introduced other measures to protect voting rights, including establishing through a package of bills, a state level voting rights act and a ban on prison gerrymandering, the Michigan Voting Rights Act formed part of a slew of measures states have been taken states have taken to fill the gaps left by weakened federal voting rights protections. New York, Connecticut, Virginia, Oregon, Oregon, Washington, and California have already passed such legislation. The Michigan Voting Rights Act would add protections for disabled voters, ban voter suppression, and expand the use of translated ballots for voters whose primary language is not English. So do you think that's the promising development in Michigan, especially compared to what we're seeing in the UK in terms of you know, ability to vote and the voter ID laws here? Yes, I mean, the voter ID law laws here are really worrying, aren't they? Um, you know, when we're out canvassing, we try and encourage people to um, take postal votes, which would make it much easier. But I am really dreading election day when voters turn up to the polling stations as they've done so many years past without any um, identification on them and them being uh, turned away. Um, I just think it's absolutely awful. It's so, so undemocratic and we already have a very undemocratic system of um, first past the post. Um, but um, I suppose um, <laughs> Joe Biden will be having a little smile to himself today as a result of the um, the uh, vote in, in Michigan, but um, I'm sure he's not counting his chickens at all. Yeah, no, that, I was also going to ask you about that. Like, do you, yeah, do you think this is like much you know, hope for Joe Biden? Because obviously he's not been polling very well in, you know, these swing states and that could affect, you know, the, the states like Michigan could be what wins or loses him the election in 2024 to Donald Trump. Yes, clearly, um, you know, there are key swing states in, um, in the uh, US election, um, a bit like kind of the red wall seats here, I, I suppose. Um, but, and it, yeah, I'm really surprised that way the polls are, are running um, in the United States. Um, 
I really, really hope they're wrong. Um, and yeah, we, and you kind of just hold your breath, don't you? But you can't hold it till November. Um, but clearly, this um, hopefully is a bit of a ray of, of light. And um, while uh, Trump is in the dock, um, in the courtroom, he's not out uh, campaigning. And we shall see what happens there. Yeah, no, we will. So to our next story, pro-EU protests in Georgia offer proposed foreign influence bill. Leading players in Georgia's national men's football team have came out in support of a, of a pro-EU protest sparked by a controversial, quote, foreign influence bill criticized for mirroring a repressive Russian law. Riot police have clashed in recent nights with large rallies of people protesting outside the parliament buildings in Tbilisi against the controversial bill, which it is claimed will hamper the country's application for EU membership. Jabba Kan Kankava, the captain of Georgia's national football team, which has recently qualified for the Euros, its first major tournament, posted a picture on Instagram of two protesters staring down riot police on Tuesday night, adding, quote, fuck Russia. A host of other national football team players, including Kvistja Kavarsti Hila, sorry for pronunciation, a winger for Italy's Sierra A Club, Napoli, and Giorgi um, Mara, Maradesh Vili is a La Liga is a goalkeeper for Valencia in Spain's La Liga, also posted what appeared to be coordinated methods on social media. They wrote, quote, Georgia's path is to Europe. The European will unite us. Forward to Europe, peace to Georgia. David Kelevashi, who served as Georgia's defense minister at the time of the 2008 Russian invasion of the country, said, quote, the footballer's decision to back the protests may prove to be a decisive intervention coming just weeks after millions took to the streets to celebrate their Euro 2024 qualification. Under a draft bill introduced to Parliament on Monday, organizations receiving more than 20% of their funds from abroad will be required to register as being agents of foreign influence with fines for those who do not comply. The law has been likened to the Russian legislation under which journalists, politicians, rights organizations, environmentalist groups, LGBTQ support networks, and others have been obliged to label themselves as, quote, foreign agents when they publish. The legislation has provoked violence inside and outside the parliament building. Footage broadcast on Monday on Georgian television showed Mamuka Midrenzi, the leader of the ruling Georgian Dream Party's parliamentary faction and a driving force behind the bill, being punched in the face by the opposition MP Aleko Elashevi while speaking from the dispatch box. Crowds of about 10,000 people protested outside the parliament building in Tbilisi on Monday and Tuesday night when they clashed with riot police. Despite the protests, 83 out of 150 deputies voted in favour of the bill on Wednesday, which must pass two more readings before becoming law. So, Maureen, do you think these protests are going to have an effect on whether or not this bill managed to make it through? Well, it's interesting um, that footballers have got uh, involved. It's not something that um, we see in this country. And I suppose it um, depends how representative the footballers are of um, the electorate um, at large. But the way that Georgia, the rulers in Georgia seem to be mirroring Putin in uh, the way they act um, is very interesting. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say about this. I think it's one of these watch the space kind of um, things and we will see whether the uh, legislators reflect the views of the footballers and how many of the, um, the voters in Georgia they, they represent. Yeah, I mean, we'll find out soon what happens with that story whenever it goes to the next readings of Parliament. Um, so to our next story, Scotland's heritage sector publishes a roadmap to help tackle skills gap. 
A new five-year plan has been launched today to help tackle Scotland's heritage skills gap. The skills strategy is a collaborative framework to create collective solutions that support the future of our historic environment and the communities across Scotland that rely on it. The Skills Investment Plan, SIP, identifies priority actions to build a healthy and sustainable skill system which supports paid staff, volunteers, sole traders and organisations of all sizes spanning this diverse sector. Over its lifespan, the plan will focus on three priority themes to grow provision and build capacity, attract future talent and improve access to the workforce and foster innovation. Historic Environment Scotland HES and 15 sector partners coordinated extensive research with 160 organisations and 340 individuals to support the development of the refreshed plan, including sector sector partners, employers, volunteers, professional bodies, skilled bodies and educational institutions. Together, these groups identified the priority areas for action to continue to build on the roadmap set out in the in 2019 in the sector's first dedicated skills strategy. The first five-year plan saw progress in key areas, including the creation of employability programs in traditional building, in traditional building skills, developing a new training program in energy efficiency, and reaching nearly 15,000 young people through campaigns like Creative Careers Week, Build Your, Build Your Future, and Defend the Castle to Attract New Talent. The landscape has changed since the first plan was published and the sector continues to face challenges in attracting and retaining talent post-Brexit as well as the additional work required to bring operations back to pre-pandemic levels. The refreshed plan will be launched at the Engine Shed, Scotland's National Convention Centre, to over 100 representatives involved in skills, planning and delivery leading heritage organisations and fundraisers and will feature an address from Kaukab Stewart, Minister of Culture, Europe and International Development. Culture Minister Stewart said, quote, The launch of the Refresh Skills Investment Plan for the Historic Environment represents a significant step forward in our collective efforts to safeguard and celebrate our historic environment, but it is only the beginning and I call upon those involved to actively engage in the delivery of the skills investment plan over the next five years and face the challenge head on together with confidence and innovation. So Maureen, do you think that this plan by the sector is going to set out what it achieves to in this next five year plan? Well, clearly this is something close to my heart, having been Minister for Schools in Skills uh, when the first SNP government in, in 2007. I think there's a few points here that I'd like to address. One is that people do see culture as something that's really important and the historic environment is really important in terms of adding to the economy in the country. I mean, tourism, tourism is a huge um, creator of wealth in our country. You know, people think that it, manufacturing um, is something that you need to create wealth. But increasingly, people realise that spending in culture and in your historic environment is really important if you want to uh, attract more tourists, because that is the kind of thing that people come to see. And here I have to give credit to uh, Prince Charles, as he was then, with the what he is um setting out to achieve at Dumfries House where you can learn uh, traditional skills. There was many years, well, a few years ago, there was um, a similar person up in the Northeast who was always um, promoting traditional skills. And um, the, you know, some of the construction uh, industry training boards um, and stone maces and things promote this all the time. And it's really important to have um, young people trained in stone masonry and um, things um, like that, particular joinery, stained glass window making, these kind of skills, which are really interesting. Um, and I don't know whether, you know, programs like the repair shop and stuff like that um, encourage youngsters to take this. It's, they're never going to be 
out of a job if um, youngsters t uh, choose this path. And I think it's really important. Um, and the government is obviously taking a lead in this, which is great. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, I, I knew a guy in school who wanted to do a, you know, go into a, a, a career like that. And yeah, it sounded very cool. So yeah, yeah. it's interesting. So on to uh, our next story, the Scottish government announced new disability benefits for pensioners. Pensioners in five Scottish local authorities will be the first in the country eligible for new disability benefit, subject to parliamentary approval of regulations. From 21st of October, pension age disability payments, the replacement for attendance allowance, will be piloted in Argyll and Butte, Highland, Aberdeen City, Orkney and Shetland. The benefit will become available in 13 more local authority areas on 24th of March next year before becoming available across Scotland by 22nd of April. Pension age disability benefits is for people or people of pension age who have a disability or long-term health condition. That means they need to help looking after themselves or supervision to stay safe. It is not means tested and it is worth between 290 and 434 pounds a month depending on the needs of the person who gets it. Currently over 150,000 people in Scotland get attendance allowance from the Department of Work and Pensions. They do not need to take any action as their award will be automatically moved from the DWP to Social Security Scotland. This will happen in favourites with the first expected to be transferred in early 2025. Pension age disability payment was designed with the people who was designed with the people who will be eligible for the benefit and those who support them. Improvements include a streamlined process for people to nominate a third party representative who can support them to communicate with Social Security Scotland. Social Justice Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville said quote in the midst of the cost of living crisis, it is more important than ever that older people get the support they're entitled to. Quote, we developed pension age disability payments by listening to the people who would be applying for it and those who would support them. We made changes, including making it easier for an eligible person to nominate a third party representative, something people told us was important for many older people. Quote, the pilot phase will allow us to put our different approach into practice, learning and improving before the benefit is rolled off across Scotland. So, Maureen, what effect do you think this would have if passed on people in Scotland? Well, I think it will uh, enable them to maybe take um, a sigh of relief and um, a little bit of more hope for their future financial um, security. Um, this, I think from what you've said, Ben, is um, a continuation of the devolution of benefits, but Scotland taking a, its own approach to how um, these will be uh, distributed and always remembering um, that people who um, are entitled to benefits are, are, are treated with the dignity and respect um, that they're due. Um, it sometimes reaching pension age is a bit of a cliff edge um, for some people in terms of what they were entitled to previously and what they're entitled to after pension age. And I think anything that seen that 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 um, avoids this cliff edge and makes a, the transition more seamless um, without uh, realizing or coming to the or or uh, you know, benefits stopped immediately um, is, is to the good. And we're talking about 150,000 people here. I mean, their their energy bills aren't going to get better. Their, um, their, their situation is unlikely to be um, getting better um, as, as they age. So um, this is a very welcome news. On to our second last story, new partnership between Scottish enterprise agencies and Hyundai. Deputy First Minister Shona Robertson has welcomed the signing of a partnership between Scottish enterprise agencies and HD Hyundai Heavy Industries, which will unlock expertise in the design and manufacture of floating offshore wind substructures. Scottish Enterprise SE and 
Highland and Islands Enterprise, HIE, signed a memorandum of understanding with the company in Edinburgh, described as a, quote, vote of confidence in Scotland, committing each other to pursue opportunities for floating offshore wind projects here. It is the company's first agreement in Europe on floating offshore wind manufacturing. HD Hyundai Heavy Industries is the world's largest shipbuilding company and a major manufacturer of equipment such as the floating substructures that form a critical part of the multi-billion offshore wind supply chain. The latest in a series of key developments in the sector, the MOU follows the First Minister's announcement of strategic investment of up to £500 million over the next five years to unlock private investment in parts, manufacturing and assembly work to anchor the offshore wind supply chain in Scotland. It also builds on recent announcements of international investment into the renewable energy supply chain, including the planned £350 million Sumitomo cable factory in part of Nick, based in the Inverness and Crometry for the Green Freeport area. Up to £24.5 million of funding has been committed to this project by the Scottish Government, SE and HIE. Deputy First Minister Shona Robinson, who witnessed the MOU signing, said, quote, This partnership agreed is a vote of confidence in Scotland and our offshore wind industry, demonstrating our ability to develop the international relations upon which investment that will help us reach our climate targets is founded. Quote, Scotland's offshore wind sector is key to our transition to net zero, and this partnership is the next step forward in realising the economic opportunities from our potential floating offshore wind potential. So what do you think this new partnership will mean for Scotland and its goal of moving towards net zero? Do you think this is a big step? Well, it it sounds as if it uh, certainly could be. Um, and clearly this is something that is has come about It's clearly something um, that has come about because of um, Freeports, and it's good to see work coming back to Easter Ross and Cromarty Firth and the the port of of Nig after um, you know the boom of the the oil time um, has gone. Um, I think these um, memorandums of understanding with um, companies need to be closely uh, monitored um, to make sure that they do live up to what they're promising. Um, But anything um, that brings long-term jobs and and increases the the move or hastens the move uh, to net zero and more renewable energy production um, is a good thing. Um, but I think it needs closely monitored to see that it's doing what it promises in the memorandum of understanding. Yeah. So on to the last story of the evening. First Minister launches new technology to decarbonize global shipping. In Dumfries today, First Minister Hamza Youssef launched an innovative reactable wing wing sail, which developer Smart Green Shipping estimates can save up to 30% of fuel costs per year for commercial shipping companies. Its development has been supported by 1.8 million Scottish Enterprise Grant funding and 1.35 million pound equity investment from leading Japanese shipping company MOL Dry Bulk and Scottish Enterprise with South of Scotland Enterprise helping the company establish a base in Dumfries. Technology to optimise a ship's route based on weather forecast data will enable commercial vessels fitted with the sail to cut greenhouse gas emission and operating costs as well as reducing fuel consumption. The UN has said that shipping emits nearly 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, worldwide efforts to decarbonise the sector are crucial to meeting climate targets. The Richard Wing Sail is entirely manufactured in Scotland from 100% recycled materials and Smart Green Shipping has progressed the project with input from other Scottish engineering companies including Cayley Ocean Systems and Malin. 
The First Minister raised the 20 meter fast rig wing sail for the first time at Smart Green Shipping's test site at Hutterston. Um, at Hutterston Park, sorry. Along, alongside founder and chief executive Diana Gilpin, the First Minister said, quote, Smart Green Shipping's work on their impressive fast rig technology is typical of the type of economic opportunity the just the just transition to net zero affords Scotland as the ideal test bed for new green technology. Quote, By helping companies like Smart Green Shipping invest in innovation, we can drive growth, create jobs and increase productivity while driving transition to net zero in the shipping sector. So, Maureen, I'm wondering if you think approach like this are a better way to achieve net zero in opposed to approach which are more, you know, it's sort of, I would say like in innovation based approach like this are a better way to achieve net zero rather than other approaches which are more, fo- which, 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 put, put, which put more weight on the population already, like more restrictive approach, like carbon taxes. I think just transition is so urgent um, that we need to approach it from every possible angle that we come what that that we can, and you know this obviously shows Scottish innovation and Scottish engineering at its best. Um, global shipping does need to decarbonize. There are certain things that they've tried already, like scrubbers on the engines and things, but. I, I haven't read enough about this um, story and uh, wind sail. I mean, it's obviously not going back to <laughs> sailing ships, which is what you <laughs> think about when you talk about a wind sail. But um, um, it's it, it's um, it's really um, innovative and it's really great that this is happening in Scotland. And I also want to say congratulations to South of Scotland Enterprise. I remember sitting on the committee um, that um, helped uh, scrutinise the act to set up Scottish Enterprise, uh, South of Scotland uh, Enterprise. And clearly they are motoring ahead with um, creating new industries in the South of Scotland. Um, it would just be nice if um, the South of Scotland electorate realised that uh, the Scottish government is working in their interests and that blue wall um, was uh, broken uh, in the forthcoming election. Okay well that is all um, that is all for this evening. Before I go I just want to remind you that at Broadcasting Scotland we depend on the generosity of our supporters. Our programs will always be free to view however if you can afford £5 a month please consider becoming a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. To everyone who has donated and to everyone who has signed up to make a regular monthly payment, thank you very much. Our focus must now move to securing the future of independent broadcasting for Scotland by growing our subscriber base and regular funding. Thank you again to our guest Maureen, thanks. Bye and thank you for watching.